Well, I'd like to f first off thank, uh, thank the organizers, uh, uh, like the other speakers, for this wonderful venue. Um, the food is just incredible, and I say the city is absolutely beautiful. Um, well, on to the physics, and I hope you don't mind a little uh, repetition. Uh, I guess I'm, I benefit from having Reiner Blatt speak before me, so I can maybe uh, uh, go quickly through a, f a few of the ideas. Uh, obviously, I will talk also about trapped ions, and like, like uh, uh, the Innsbruck group and the whole community, um, we are working from the bottom up, trying to uh, uh, study many-body physics, build quantum computers, and, and so on and so forth. And the, uh, uh, we, we are slowly but steadily moving up to the few dozen regime, few dozens of qubits. And I guess the one take-home message is that, that at that level, um, maybe we need maybe three dozen. Uh, when you have uh, correlated um, uh, matter with e even just three dozen qubits, uh, some problems are impossible to calculate classically. So um, while that doesn't mean it's a fully blown quantum computer, it's more uh, a simulator of maybe even, a, uh, uh, maybe even something that's not a real material. But in any case, um, this is a good place to operate uh, anyway, from the bottom up. And I think it complements a lot of the neutral atom work in optical lattices especially that are more top down. Uh, and hopefully, and also in real condensed matter, uh, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, superconductors, um, and, and ho hopefully, you know, we can all coexist and, and plug that chasm between atomic physics and condensed matter. Well, atomic ions. Uh, so here's my analog to Reiner's picture, a bunch of ions in a trap. You've seen it before. Uh, everything I will talk about is a different species atom. That kind of doesn't matter uh, fundamentally. Uh, the ytterbium-171 ion is, is, is particularly nice, on the other hand, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why that is. Um, the, the only bad thing is it's very heavy, so we need higher electrical potentials to, to confine it to a given level. Now, this is an old trap we built about 10 years ago, and it's still, it's, it's still producing. Um, it's not that we're afraid to build new traps, it's just that, well, it's still producing. Uh, and you can sort of see that it's not really professionally done, or at least it's done in a university lab, wire bonders and so forth, even the screws there. But I'm happy to point out that the, the era of, of uh, chip traps that are uh, made mostly from silicon, uh, many multi-layer, you know, multi uh, very complicated processes, uh, is really coming of age. And I would say this is led by the group at Sandia National Labs uh, in the U.S., and there are also uh, other players there. And uh, b by now, these traps are actually the best behaving traps. I can't build a better trap than these. And so I think in 10 years, we'll all be using these traps for everything we do. It's a, uh, it's a big deal. It takes a lot of the black magic out of using these things. OK, down to atomic physics. I would say ytterbium-171 is sort of the hydrogen of atomic ions. And I say that because the, uh, the, the nucleus has a spin one half. So that means the quantum numbers are, are exactly that of hydrogen of the lowest states. And uh, the, the uh, de dealing with a qubit defined by the two clock, so-called clock states here, the m equals zero uh, uh, states in the hyperfine manifold, is a particularly clean qubit uh, uh, because it's first order insensitive to magnetic field fluctuations. Uh, the hyperfine splitting in ytterbium is 12.6 gigahertz, and this acts as our qubit. Uh, like any uh, atomic ion or cold neutral atom, you want to be able to scatter lots of photons to detect the atoms. And in, in this case, we take advantage of this cycling transition between the F equals 1 manifold and the P1 half F equals 0 state. Um, it can decay to these other two Zeeman levels, but we clean that up with, by, by having different polarized beams that I don't, I don't draw here. And this is a very bright line, the line width of 20 megahertz, and we can, we can scatter lots of light and collect some of that light and still get a healthy signal. And so this is, uh, this is data from my, uh, my colleague Jung Sang Kim at, down the road at Duke University. Um, and here, uh, in an integration time of just 50 microseconds, he, gets, he collects about 30 photons on average. This is a repetition of many experiments. And uh, this would be indicative of having an atom in the state spin up. And the point here, of course, is if the atom is in the other state, it's largely dark because it's 12 gigahertz away from a 20 megahertz line. And here's the corresponding data 
under the same, this, it's the same experiment, just putting the atom in the other state. And the, the clear separation between these two distributions uh, in, in Jung Sang's experiment gives him three nines of detection efficiency or detection fidelity in just 50 microseconds. If two nines are good enough, 99%, um, he can integrate for just 10 microseconds. So it's a very fast detector. And the data I'll show, we're sort of halfway in between, we're at about 99 and a half percent. And what has uh, afforded the, the Duke group to get such a uh, high light collection is, well, a very high numerical aperture lens, and we have a few in our labs as well. And as an aside, um, this lens, it's a, a numerical aperture 0.6 uh, objective, and that collects 10 percent of the light. Um, and uh, th this is a crystal of exactly two ions separated by five, a little more than five microns. And the resolution here is pretty, pretty good. It's diffraction limited, so about 0.34 microns full with half max. And because it's such a bright source and it's, it's such a tiny source, we uh, played around with seeing what, what's the position sensitivity. We can basically integrate on this. And, and uh, th this, this, this plot shows the uh, uh, uncertainty in the position of the single atom versus integration time. And it marches down uh, roughly one over root time bottoming out to about a little under two nanometers of resolution at 0.2 seconds. And the, the sensitivity we measure is about half a nanometer per root hertz. And this, this line here is shot noise from the photons. So this, that's kind of neat. I think it's, as far as I know, it's, it's, it's among the best resolutions uh, in any uh, atom or molecule from fluorescence detection. And in fact, we've used this, put a razor blade in front of the image to directly detect the motion of the atom. But that's a little bit of an aside. Um, the more interesting, I would say, laser interaction is the coherent one that allows us to, to make superpositions and eventually entanglements, as I'll discuss. Um, and this is probably what makes ytterbium shine. Uh, the fact that we can drive these, these stimulated Raman transitions between the hyperfine levels to, to make superpositions and do coherent operations. And um, the ytterbium has such a large, fine structure splitting, about 100 terahertz, that, that um, there's something akin to a magic wavelength where you would like to tune your uh, off-resonant beam to drive transitions here, and it's a third of the way in between these two. Um, and so that's a detuning from the nearest excited state of 33 terahertz. And the great thing is that this wavelength, this magic wavelength in ytterbium is 355, which is a wonderful wavelength because you can get, you can buy as much power as you want. It's not tunable, um, and, and uh, this is just a very friendly laser to use. Now, another thing about this transition, and here we take advantage of the fact that um, we have a microwave-defined qubit, is that the, the absolute tuning of this laser doesn't matter. So we're never, ever sensitive to optical phase, and that's, uh, that's, that's key to moving forward in this field. So um, now 355 lasers typically come in a mode lock variety, so it's pulsed, which is actually a very good thing as well because we need to generate a beat note at 12.6 gigahertz, and that's not easy to do even in the visible. But because it's a mode lock laser with a typical rep rate on the order of 100 megahertz, and these are 10 picosecond pulses, the bandwidth of about 100 gigahertz more than covers that hyperfine splitting. And so we can integrate, we can sum over every pair of, of comb teeth that are separated by, I guess, about 126 orders. Uh, and you use all the power of these pulses to drive Raman transitions. Now, there's some control and stability required on the rep rate, but that's actually very easy to, to, to get. Partly because the laser, um, the laser is uh, the, the model that we're very happy with is made by Coherent. Um, it's a 355 laser used for CMOS fab. Um, so they, the, this company stamps out 200 of these lasers a year. So it's not the laser you use for atomic physics. It's an industrial laser. And what I love best about it is there's only one knob. It's the on-off knob. So you turn it on and you're done with it. So we've, we have several of these lasers. A few of them have been operating pretty much continuously for couple of years, no degradation in power whatsoever. Uh, so this is great, and I would, I would take a little license in saying this is the cleanest optical Raman transition in all of AMO because the laser is so well engineered. More on that maybe later. Um, okay, so by controlling this laser and, and uh, its various acoustic optic modulators, we can drive transitions, sideband transitions, very similar to what Reiner uh, Blot talked about, only in this case we have Raman transitions instead of direct transitions. So let me start to tell you how we link together atoms to do interesting things. And the first, the first stage of um, 
of making many body states is to make two body entangled states. And this might better be called quantum gates if you want to build a quantum computer. So let's go in that direction for a little while. Well, um, Reiner summarized a little bit about how this works. It's sort of an old story. And let me, there's, there's sort of a very, um, it's, it's more than hand waving, but there, there's a very uh, simple way to see how these ions are entangled. And it covers pretty much every scheme you can think of including the fa very famous Serac and Zoller model 20 years ago, which was really the first uh, proposal that showed uh, any physical system could be wired together in a, in a straightforward way, in a controllable way to make entanglements, and in principle in a scalable way. Um, so, so the idea is if we have several ions, say in a linear chain, it really doesn't matter so much, uh, we're going to take advantage of something called what I call a spin-dependent force, or a qubit state-dependent force. Uh, it's sort of, if you're a neutral atom uh, buff with optical lattices, it's sort of like a spin-dependent optical lattice, but we're not using it to trap. We're using it to just modulate the position of these atoms. So if we want to entangle, say, these two atoms, we're going to apply two laser beams that are, that are just going to hit those two atoms, and the force, we will say, uh, for the sake of argument, will be in the transverse direction, and it's easy to remember. If the atom is in state spin-up, the force will be up. If the atom is in state down, the force is down. Now, when you do it on both atoms simultaneously, their Coulomb interaction, just these two ions, their Coulomb interaction is modulated. And it's modulated by exactly this amount. Uh, you can th see this. If you consider both atoms spin up, uh, they move together, so there's no change. Same with spin down. But if they're in different spin states, they're a little further apart. By exactly this amount of energy uh, uh, is the difference in the configurations. And what we see is there's an effective dipole-dipole interaction when you do this, one over our cubed. And the effective dipole is just the charge, uh, a single uh, charge times the separation, which can be several nanometers. And the effective dipole moment's pretty big. So you can think of this as an electric dipole if you want in certain regimes. And now if you look at the truth table, now going into quantum computing language here, if you look at the truth table of all four possibilities of those two spins, those two qubits, the ones that have different spin states suffer a phase lag. And that phase is linear in time, depends on, depends on uh, how much laser power you have, how much you're pushing the atoms around. And when this phase is pi over 2, we call that a maximally entangled uh, state. It generates maximally entangled states. It's equivalent to a controlled dot gate and so forth. This is a, it's called a phase gate. And this is sort of the recipe. And I would say that the serac zoller model and, and the others that sort of refined that idea, they all involve coupling the spin to the motion using a spin-dependent force. Now, one thing I didn't talk about is if you're going to apply a force like this and you're not fast, you're going to make all kinds of uh, ripples in the motion, you're going to have to deal with the collective modes of motion. I'll talk about that in a minute, but this actually is accurate, an accurate description if you do it really fast. If you have a lot of laser power in a short amount of time, faster than the trap frequency, which is a megahertz or so, then this is actually accurate. I'm not really sweeping anything under the rug. And there are proposals to do this. And some experiments, uh, I, won't, I won't talk about these experiments from our group, but we're well on our way toward making gates that are in the nanosecond, tens of nanosecond regime in the future. And this may be important uh, as time goes on. OK, so what about those normal modes? Yes, it's a nasty issue. If you have all these ions and you do what I just said, you're actually going to be entangling the spins with all these modes of motion. It's, it's, really, it's really a mess. Now, if, if you look at a linear trap at the uh, basics, um, in, in practice, we always try to squeeze them along the transverse dimension as, as tight as we can go. We apply as much voltage as we can, and then we can't turn it up anymore, and we say that's, we have to live with that. If you want to put a lot of ions in this trap, you, you have to make the axial direction um, sufficiently weak so that they, so that the ions want to lie along a line. If the axial dimension is not weak enough, then the, then then they will form kinks and zigzags and so forth. Um, so you, you have to maintain this condition here. Um, it's it's sort of a nonlinear function because this is a Coulomb crystal uh, and it's inhomogeneous and so forth. But this has been known for some time that you have to, as you add ions, you have to make the axial dimension weaker and weaker. So if you look at the normal mode spectrum. The lowest axial mode is the center of mass mode. And as you add ions, this gets lower and lower. 
And the other axial modes are regularly separated. They're not harmonics exactly, these normal modes, but they're, they're pretty far separated. Uh, and because these are low frequencies, they're not very good, certainly for lots of ions. Instead, we, we, do, we use the transverse modes. I think Reiner mentioned this as well. The transverse modes have the feature that they're all, they, they can all be very high frequency because by design you've sort of frozen out the, the, the transverse directions of motion. Um, the price you pay is that they're all squeezed together. That's what it means to be in this limit, this sort of tight limit where, where they're frozen out. All the transverse modes are really close together. Um, and so it's very hard to isolate one mode. So if you apply a spin-dependent force, you're sort of going to hit all the modes and it's a little bit of a mess. Well, it, it sort of is, and this, this is a linear scaling problem, I would say, because we're going to tune our laser. This is the detuning from the carrier, so we're going to be, these are, you should think of these as, as, as sidebands, motional sidebands on top of the spin flip carrier here at zero detuning. If you tune your lasers in the Serac Zoller or the Molmer Sorensen scheme to, to be uh, detuned from all these modes, it, it has a coupling to all of the modes. Um, and all of these harmonic oscillators are, are, are evolving in time with their detuning from this, from this force. And they're not commensurate in general. You can't hope they're commensurate. Maybe two or three ions you can find particular places where they're nearly commensurate. But lots of ions, forget it, they're not commensurate. Um, but it turns out there's a way you can still get all these phase spaces to close and you can have the motion of all, every one of the modes uh, disentangle at the end of the operation. It requires some classical control theory. Um, and what we do, in fact, I'm not going to talk much more about it, but we, we, uh, we apply lasers that are pulse shaped in time so that the classical motion of the ions uh, is disentangled at the end. I say classical, it's quantum motion, but they're harmonic oscillators. So we can calculate exactly what's going on. And this pulse shaping is described in this theory and experimental paper. This is work first suggested by Lu Ming Duan uh, at Michigan back in 05 or 06. Um, and so our native gate, when, when we want to apply uh, a beam to, to two ions and deal with all these modes of motion, the natural gate that emerges, we call it an icing gate. It's not the phase gate I talked about before, but it's, it's, it's basically due to this molmer sorensen interaction. It's an icing gate. And when, the, when this phase here, it's, it, it's very much like this phase being pi over 2. When that phase is pi over 2, this is equivalent to a fully entangling gate. You can make bell states from this. So this is our native two qubit gate. Okay. Um, so we, we've uh, been playing on, uh, playing around with crystals of ions, sort of scaling up a single crystal to see how far we can go. And we're not quite done, but we, we stopped for the moment at five, which sounds trivial. Anything with five qubits is trivial, because you can calculate it on your PC no matter what it is. Nevertheless, we, we, what's interesting, of course, is that we have a path to go to maybe 32 or so, maybe 10, maybe 20. So here's the system. We have counter-propagating Raman beams to, make, to, to, to give us a, 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 a force sensitivity. One of the beams is global, it's big, and the other one has individual addressing. And this is a very special device. We, we, um, we split our laser into a bunch of beams with a diffractive optical element, actually 10 beams. Uh, we only use five of them, though. Um, and we can turn, th th this AOM has multiple channels. It has 32 channels, and we can turn on and off any one of those 32 beams well, 10 beams, uh, by, by controlling the RF hitting the, the particular cell that, 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 that's, uh, that the laser beam goes through. And the, this AOM is imaged, imaged onto the ions, and then we have individual beams. And so this is, these aren't ions, these are laser beams um, focused down to sub-micron sub wastes. There's the 10 of them. And again, we, we now have great electronic control of these laser beams. Um, so it's only five ions, but the great thing is we can turn on beams to hit any pair of those five. With five qubits, there are ten possible pairs, and we can do a gate on all ten of those pairs. That's pretty powerful, even though it's only five ions. Uh, and I think the point is we, we think this will be scaled to more than five, probably not 500, but uh, 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 32 is an obvious number because that's where, uh, that's where this, this AOM turns off. Um, so here's a good example of, of a, a, an algorithm. It's not, not a useful one. It's only five qubits. Um, but this algorithm takes five input states and computes the Fourier transform of those five input states. There's the transform right there. 
Um, and uh, this circuit is very well known. It's a textbook circuit. But the, the hard part about this circuit is that it involves uh, a two qubit entangling gate between all possible pairs. And that's why it's never been implemented before. Nobody's had that amount of control of qubits. What is this? What is this gate here? It's not the icing gate I talked about. This is called a controlled phase gate. Um, it's similar to the first gate I showed uh, with the, with the, uh, with the ultra-fast uh, ultra um, laser beams. The, uh, the controlled phase gate is um, we can compile it into our native icing gates in this way. And so our icing gate has an argument. Remember, we can, we can apply the icing gate for any amount of time we want. And uh, that allows us to have a continuous variable here. Um, and there are a bunch of rotations. I won't get into this. But this is the controlled phase gate. So. Uh, do, a, do a Z rotation on, on the second qubit, uh, depending on the state of the first qubit. Um, and so, so we can apply this quantum Fourier transform to a bunch of target input states. In the end, um, for instance, Shor's factoring algorithm uses the QFT on the output step. Once you calculate uh, superposition of all the, I guess all the, you're, you're, you're doing some modular exponentiation, you need to do the quantum Fourier transform of that before you make the measurement. But here, uh, for this experiment, the input state was a very simple product state. This, does, this looks entangled, but it's actually not. It's just a simple product state, and it has period eight. And if you take the Fourier, quantum Fourier transform of that, you expect to see, of the 32 basis states of five qubits, you expect to see eight of them appear. That's actually down here in the lower left corner. So after doing the QFT on this input state, uh, this particular input state, we, this, the date is in red, and, and the, the gray bars indicate what we expected from theory. And we can also implement a variety of other periods. And, and you know, everything kind of hangs together. The data is not perfect. Each, e each of these gates, uh, if you consider um, uh, that each controlled phase gate has a bunch of gates. This is about 95 gates overall. So in the end, uh, that for 95 gates, it's not too bad, I guess, given that each gate is only 98, 99% pure. OK. so. Again, that's sort of a demonstration. Um, there's another fun, fun demonstration we, we, we did on a lark. Um, and this is an algorithm. I hesitate to call it algorithm because it's only five qubits. It's, it's trivial. But again, it's a demonstration that we hope will be implemented on a much bigger system that makes it interesting. The hidden shift algorithm. OK, so this is um, one of the series of um, demonstration algorithms that sh it's, th there's sometimes called oracle problems, where you're able to, you, you want to extract some global information about a function. Uh, in this case, you're given two functions, and you're told that they're, they're identical, except the input is shifted by an unknown amount. And the question is, what is that unknown amount? How many function evaluations must you, m must you um, implement to learn what that shift is? Well, classically, you have to evaluate the function on the order of n times, where n is the number of, number of bits involved in the function. Quantum mechanically, you can do it in a single query. And here's the circuit for one per, it's, it's only four qubits. We use the fifth qubit as an ancilla, sort of a detail. But this is a four qubit algorithm, and this is the circuit for a particular shift, 1011. And of course, we can implement all 16 possible shifts. We have full control of this five qubit system. We can do any kind of anything you want. And so this is the result. Five qubits, there's, sorry, it's five qubits, one is an ancilla. So of the four qubits in the function, uh, we have all 16 possible shifts, and we detected the shift with, you know, okay, 80% fidelity or so. Lots of gates here, by the way. These are, con again, controlled phase gates where the phase is 90 degrees. Um, what's interesting about this, I guess, is that um, we've, we've been working with the Microsoft gang who's thinking about quantum compilers, Martin Rodler and Nathan uh, Wiebe, and, and they, they ran this, they ran this same, um, the same algorithm on the IBM Quantum Experience Cloud you may have heard of. So IBM, to their credit, have built a superconducting device with five qubits, and they've made it available to the public with an interface, and it's self-calibrating and so forth. Um, very interesting. So lots of thousands of people are, are, are signed up to use it, including our friend Martin Rodler, and he, he implemented the hidden shift algorithm on their system and got this data, which is quite a bit worse. And um, now, it's a little bit apples and oranges uh, because the superconducting system, um, well, it has a much higher clock speed. That's the good thing. 
Uh, but the bad thing is the connectivity of the five qubits is really poor in the superconducting system. They're connected in a star pattern. So if you want to do a gate between these two, you know, you got to move information around and all kinds of headroom and swapping and so forth. So it's actually not good. Of course, our system's fully connected, so we don't have that overhead. And that's exactly why the data is a lot better. So to our, to, to our knowledge, this is the first comparison of a, of a given algorithm on two different hardwares. And this is, I, I think, the first of many experiments that'll happen in the future. Any computer, you know, any computation is independent of the hardware. And so if, if you think you're doing something interesting, hopefully you'll be able to apply it to different hardwares. And right now, uh, you know, this one, one thing we're seeing in the field is that ions and superconducting circuits are starting to rise up in terms of being able to be built to, to interesting sizes. Okay, let me um, now talk about applying the same type of spin-dependent forces, but now globally instead of individually. And you can call it a global quantum gate if you want. Uh, I would rather call it a quantum simulation because we're in a position to simulate magnetism, and I think Rainer Blanc talked a little bit about the introduction there. So here, um, I won't even tell you how this is generated. Reiner did, and it's very similar to the gates I, I talked about before. But the one, sep the one difference now is that we apply the spin-dependent force in the far detuned limit so that we're not making, the, the phonons are virtually excited. So the, the normal mode excitations, they're very weak, and so to a very good approximation, we have a pure spin model, and there are no phonons involved. The price we pay is it's not fast. So th th these couplings are on the order of kilohertz. So millisecond type time scales for the exchange. Um, so um, this, uh, in this Hamiltonian, uh, we, we, we can apply, and Reiner again summarized how uh, this has a long range interaction where we can tune the range of the interaction with a simple laser detuning. Um, and one set of experiments, a very simple uh, start, is to uh, try to do adiabatic uh, quantum uh, uh, evolution to, to determine the ground state of an interesting Hamiltonian. And in this case, the interesting Hamiltonian is just a, a long-range icing model. Well, for 30 spins, a long-range icing model is interesting because it's very hard to calculate the ground state and certainly to, ca to calculate excited states, gaps, and so forth. So in this experiment, we might, uh, following this cartoon, we might prepare the ions in the ground state of a trivial part of the Hamiltonian, in this case, prepare them to be anti-aligned along the y direction, so they're all pointing sideways, and then we adiabatically lower b and increase j. Well, we adiabatically lower b over j, and in, the, in practice, we do this by keeping j fixed and starting with b very high and then lowering it. And if we were adiabatic about it, entropy is conserved. If we started in the ground state, and B goes to zero, we should remain in the ground state, but now of this more interesting Hamiltonian. And then we can simply measure the spins along the uh, direction, any, any direction, actually. So this is data I've shown before. And re real quickly, it's very visual. Uh, this is with 10 ions, 10 spins. This, these are calibration pictures all up and all down. So they're all bright, they're all dark. And in this experiment, well, with 10 spins, there are 1,024 configurations of those spins. And so we ran this adiabatic ramp 2,600 times, and we were hoping to see anti-ferromagnetic Niel order because the, the, uh, the couplings are positive. The ground state, they should, be, they should be staggered up, down, up, down, up, down. Well, out of 2,600 times, we saw about 17% of the time one of the two Niel states. Well, the other 83% of the time, we saw other stuff. Because we were not adiabatic, we were actually studying dynamics in this experiment, and so 8% of the time, we saw one of these four states with a domain wall toward the middle of the chain. 4% of the time, we saw one of these states with a domain wall further out, and so on and so forth. There's 10, 24 states, and we can, we can basically tabulate the appearance of every one of them arranged in binary order here. So this is the initial state. Along the x direction, it's up plus down to the 10th power, so we have all states. And then after the ramp, um, we were hoping these two would have 150% each. They were about 9% each. Um, those are the two Niel ordered states. And then we have all this other stuff, which is populated because of uh, a minimum gap and so forth. So there's dynamics going on here. And um, to ma maybe push the point more, by doing the same experiment with 14 spins, 16,000 configurations, we see that the two ground states only come out with about 3% um, population uh, probability. Um, 
And here, because we have a long range anti ferromagnetic model, it's highly frustrated. And the more spins, the more frustrated it is, the smaller the gaps, the harder it is to be adiabatic. Um, and in this experiment, we were rather stupid. We didn't slow down the experiment because, laser, well, I said these lasers are perfect. There is at some time scale amplitude noise in the laser that effectively looks like spin noise. And that's what limited us there. Um, I will add that these measurements are only of correlations, um, but we do have evidence of entanglement in many of these experiments. There are many ways to think about this. One very indirect is to reverse the adiabatic ramp and see that you got to the initial polarized state. Um, Another is to measure witness operators like spin squeezing in certain, uh, in certain states. This one's not very good for spin squeezing, but the ferromagnetic version is. And with 69s, we observe a few dB of squeezing, um, which is actually a lot for the, for the number of atoms involved, uh, uh, but that's one way. Another, another uh, witness more general than squeezing is called the quantum Fisher information, which um, uh, sort of uh, doesn't always depend on a, a particular form of the state, but I'm not going to talk too much about that. These are all l little bit indirect measurements. Witness operators are, are as useful as they'll go. Um, so with, with this quantum simulator, um, we and other, other groups have done a variety of experiments over the last few years especially. Uh, Reiner talked a little bit about the propagation of correlations. He also talked about uh, uh, benchmarking the Hamiltonian, doing many-body spectroscopy. Um, I want to highlight a couple of r very recent r results involving um, the concept of quantum thermalization. And we're going to hear a lot more, I think, uh, in this meeting, especially uh, Marcus Greiner uh, is going to be talking about thermalization, how quantum systems, even closed quantum systems, can be seen to thermalize. Well, there are some counterexamples to that, where quantum systems, closed quantum systems, do not thermalize. And not just because they're integrable, uh, but because, for instance, uh, there, there are gap sizes that are really small and it just takes forever for them to eventually thermalize and that would be pre-thermalization, I won't talk much about that. But another very interesting uh, uh, topic many folks in AMO and also condensed matter are considering is many-body localization, an extension of Anderson localization in the context of a many-body many -body system. And so if, in, in our experiment, um, we can study aspects of many-body localization uh, I, sh I, should, I should preface this by, by saying a few years ago, Brian DeMarco at Illinois and Emmanuel Bloch at uh, Max Planck Institute measured um, uh, transport properties of atoms in optical lattices showing localization effects. And also, I think Misha Lukin at this conference will talk about uh, similar uh, localization uh, of, of spins in, in an NV diamond ensemble. Well, in our case, again, from the bottom up, we start with about 10, in, in this case, exactly 10 spins. Um, and we're, we're going to uh, initialize them to be in a staggered state along Z. We can just do this with laser beams. It's not, I wouldn't call it nail ordered. We, we insist that they, they be in this state. Uh, uh, and then if the icing interaction is going to be along X, you can see that this state sort of populates all 1024 states. It's sort of like an infinite temperature state if you want. Um, next, we, instead of adiabatically turning on the icing, interaction, we, we turn it on quickly. We quench the system to this icing interaction. And we may have a transverse field. And we may have a disordered transverse field that's site dependent. That's actually key in many body localization. Uh, and then finally, we, it's a sort of simple experiment. We measure the atoms along Z at time T. And we look for a memory. Now, the nice thing about this system is that this, this disordered field is from an AC start shift of an individual laser beam that's hitting each atom. So we can program it to obey any distribution, to have any amplitude we want. Very controlled here. Um, and so here's some data without disorder. So here we just have a transverse field icing model. And for various values of the transverse field, we see eventually the spins. Here we have, remember, there were five up and five down. So at zero time, there's five up and five down. But they all end up sort of thermalizing in their own closed way <laughs> uh, to have no magnetization. Measuring, uh, measuring here along z. Um, so we'll key on the, the, the b over j is equal to 4 in the next data. So, so we have, we have non-commuting terms of the Hamiltonian making it interesting and non-integrable. Um, and here's the same data I just showed. And we see that there's what we, we would call this thermalization. The, the atom, the, each atom sort of uh, ultimately arrives at zero magnetization. Well, now when we add disorder, 
some amount of disorder par parameterized by, this is a uniform distribution over some range 2w. Um, and so when 2w is, is eight times the nearest neighbor icing coupling, we see that there's a memory. The system acts as though it won't thermalize, it stops thermalizing. Now, it's unfortunate, I go down to the lab and I say, well, J, JT is only 10, can't you go to 10,000? Well, there are all kinds of issues there, but, and you should, you, you should be, you know, you should look at these lines and wonder, yeah, is there a tiny bit of a slope there? Will that eventually thermalize? Um, it's a good question. It's a finite system, uh, and there are edge effects that are pronounced, but uh, in any case, that's clearly different than that. And so we can characterize this memory by uh, measuring, uh, by simply measuring how far the quantum state left from its initial value, and we can parameterize this in terms of a Hamming distance. It's basically the number of, the number of positions that we saw spin flips. If we start at zero time, there's no Hamming distance because there was no evolution. Um, and a Hamming distance of 0.5, this is, this is scaled divided by n, 0.5 means we've thermalized. And you can see by adding disorder, we, we're retaining more memory of the initial state. And that's the phenomenon of localization, basically, for different amounts of disorder. And so here we can plot the, the steady state value of this distance traveled versus the amount of disorder. Not much is happening for small amounts of disorder, but then at a certain threshold amount of disorder, we, we really see that the memory is, is starting to take hold. And I wouldn't call that a phase transition. I wouldn't call anything a phase transition, I guess, with only 10 particles. Um, Maybe it's more of a crossover. I don't know. It comes into philosophy pretty fast. But here's, here's some data showing this, um, uh, uh, the same, the same uh, amount of memory retention versus the power law of the interaction. And we see when the interaction gets shorter and shorter range, we see more, uh, lo more localization as expected. Okay. Um, and finally, uh, I, I mentioned Fisher information before, and again, I, I can't talk too much about it, it's a particular witness operator. In our case, it's given by this operator there. And it turns out there are, there are thresholds when the quantum Fisher information is above one in this case, then there's entanglement in the system. Um, and there are some other assumptions that go in here, and I, I, you should consult uh, Philip Halka in particular from Peter Zoller's group who, who collaborated with us on this. Now, without disorder, we see over time that this quantum Fisher information is sort of decreasing. But with disorder, we see that it's increasing. And this is actually a hallmark of many body localization, that, that entanglement grows with time. And so that's uh, it's sort of uh, what's of interest in this measurement. So um, very, very quickly, um, with 22 spins, uh, uh, here, here they are in, in, in another experiment without disorder, uh, where, where there are cases where the, the minimum gap can be really small making the thermalization time constant really long, there is a phenomenon called pre-thermalization. And uh, in this case, we start with one spin up, all the others spin down. So there's sort of one excitation at the end of the chain, and then we wait. Uh, and in this case, we wait for a time that's 36 over the nearest neighbor icing coupling, JT of 36, and we see that the excitation's hardly moved. There's only one excitation here, and this is an, obviously an average over many runs. And we can see there's clearly, the, 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 the uh, evolution sort of stopped. Uh, at least it's halted over short times. Now, at long times, this will go to zero. Uh, but the problem is uh, the, the long times are more like 36,000, JT of 36,000, we can't observe that. But because the slope is very low here, this is, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a controversial subject, but um, uh, it's sort of an indirect observation of something that might be called pre-thermal. Okay, so I, I wanna start to wrap up and and su suggest how we might wire up modules of several, maybe 32 <laughs> spins in each, in each cluster. Um, now, I would claim that anything that's complex is going to be modular, it has to be, in order to maintain its complexity. I don't know that's, if that's a theorem, but uh, in practice, um, certainly in quantum computing, if you make the system too big, eventually it just stops behaving quantum. Um, so uh, w one approach in ions is to actually do this shuttling idea where you make a very complex ion trap and move them around through, 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 the, uh, through the system with all kinds of electrodes. And you know, Dave Weiland's pushed this, pushed this idea the most, I would say. Uh, Winnie Hensinger has a poster on, on uh, a very high-level proposal to do this uh, in the context of a bunch of, bunch of silicon atom chips. And again, he'll, he'll leverage that work on, as we all do in ion traps, on the existence of these beautiful chips that are being, uh, being uh, uh, built by many labs. 
But I want to talk very briefly about another way to hook up ions, and that is optically with photons. And the great thing about photons is that this hookup is distant independent. It doesn't matter how far they are apart. And that connectivity is going to be very important. It, it'll allow you to not have to worry about the overhead of moving, uh, m moving information uh, through nearest neighbor couplings throughout the, throughout the system. And so here, uh, again, ions are very uh, uh, simple emitters. In this set of experiments, we, um, we can excite a single atom to the, to the excited state and let it decay. And because it's an ultrafast pulse, much faster than the lifetime, we can, uh, and after some microwave uh, manipulations, we can have a post-selected entanglement between the polarization of that photon and the spin. Um, and again, using this fancy lens of numerical aperture 0.6, that's the 10% solid angle there, we can actually collect photons, single photons that are post-selected and tangled with the spin at a pretty high rate. Now, what's magic is when you do this twice, uh, uh, this is a well-known effect in quantum optics, the hangu mandel interference. When you do this twice, uh, you can, instead of having post-selected entanglement, you can create heralded entanglement, where the detection of uh, appropriate co coincidence events behind these detectors will herald the entanglement of your spins. And uh, again, no cavities here. We're just collecting light with a very fancy lens, trying to do things fast, and we're generating entanglement at uh, uh, approaching 5 to 10 hertz or so at that rate. It's still pretty slow. But I think we know how to, uh, even without cavities, go to 1, or one to 10 kilohertz. And that, that's, that's actually going to be interesting, because that's almost as fast as Coulomb gates, the stuff I talked about before, all without cavities. Um, and so we can have our own very high-level picture, and this is with collaborate with Jung Sang Kim, and thinking a very high-level view of how you might wire these modules together, involving a bunch of optical elements that exist uh, cross-connect switches, CCDs, and, and uh, beam splitters, and so forth. And the idea here is, depending on the configuration of that switch, when two pixels fire on the appropriate channels of the CCD, two ions are entangled that could be, you know, very far apart. And, you know, current, current state of the art is not so impressive. You know, uh, we can do it between two modules at, at, about, at about 10 hertz, but we actually got four orders of magnitude better in the last five years, and maybe, I think, I think there are a few orders of magnitude that we can get by just doing better optics. Um, so better optics means modularizing that. That's a mess. I'm not proud of this experiment. This, this, I'm proud of the experiment, but I'm not proud of this, you know, just how ugly it looks. And um, um, we, we will be able to shrink that down to about that. In fact, we're working on that right now. Um, uh, and in fact, there's our nice laser, vacuum chamber, and so forth into two racks to have control of maybe 50 to 100 qubits. And again, I, I kept mentioning superconducting circuits, and uh, this is one of my last slides here. Um, the, the ion system and the superconducting circuits are really sticking out now, uh, ready to be built. And I think uh, my colleague Jung Sang Kim says it best that the superconducting community has a qubit problem. The atomic system has a controller problem. Our qubits are nearly perfect, but controlling them is challenging. And it's sort of different challenges, so they'll, they'll evolve together. And I think they will attack different applications as well. So I think there's going to be room for these two technologies in, in coming years. And I should note that last week there was a wonderful meeting at Caius uh, that, that had many of the world's experts in these two technologies to talk about uh, uh, applied quantum information. So with that, that's my last slide. Thanks for your attention. Okay, we have time only for one short question, please. Yes, basic. Well, it's a comment, actually, because at some moment when you said Fisher information is more general witness, I wouldn't call it more general. It's kind of independent. As you know, Fisher information can detect entanglement of states which do not have any squeezing and also can detect of non-Gaussian squeeze states, so it's kind of independent in a sense. Second time you said particular witness, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the question there or is that just a comment? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you again. Yeah, so. <laughs> and uh, the, the next speaker of this session is Akira Horusawa. So the talk is about uh, hybrid quantum information processing. <laughs> That's 
確かにな。